name is Elizabeth Wilcox, and I am a senior consultant at Central HR uh, Learning and Development. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to present at the NOW conference on this absolutely awesome, cool topic, the future of work. In fact, I've absolutely been anticipating uh, this day because I've worked very hard on this topic over more than two years now, and I can't wait to share uh, this with you. Uh, before I get started, I want you to make a couple of predictions yourself about the future of work. Uh, probably something ran through your head when you saw this session, when you saw the session title, or when you read the description, and something kind of percolated in you, uh, which is why you stepped into the room today. So I'm going to take a minute for you just to t make a prediction using this sheet with these three squares on it. Uh, something maybe excited you about the future of work and you had a positive association with it. Maybe something occurred to you that was a fear or something that you predict might potentially be negative. Or maybe you have a question about the future of work. Um, so I want you to take a minute to jot that down, OK? And, ha and, and hang on to that, because we're going to return to this during this session. So I'm just going to give you a minute to think through that, OK? So just look into your crystal ball, and what, does occur what occurs to you about the future of work? OK, so if you were only able to write down one thing, that's OK. But if you, you know, your mind was rapid and you thought about three things, great. So we're going to return to this. So I'm going to start by telling you how I became interested in this topic, because it has very, very profound both personal and professional threads. OK? So I want to start by introducing you to my people. This is my family of origin. This is my, uh, the first Americans in my family. Uh, the woman in the very front row, this stern-looking matriarch in the center, is my great-great-grandmother. And behind her, second from the right, is my great-grandmother, my grandmother's mother. This was one of the hardest working families you could ever meet. They started, uh, uh, they were, from, were originally from Cornwall, England, where we were tin miners. And this family emigrated to Africa, where they became diamond miners. And eventually, they settled in Pennsylvania, where they became coal miners. So I am a very, very distant coal miner's daughter. This family had a lot of important things working in its favor. The first was that they were able to immigrate toward plentiful work. And they did find plentiful, uh, good work. The second thing they had at work for them was that they had very affordable public education, which they used to their advantage. They had essentially access to free, high quality education. And the third thing is when they came to the United States, they had a much more fluid class structure. And they were able to be much more upwardly social mob mob socially mobile than they would have been in England. And this family, my family, within a single generation, was able to go from blue collar work to white collar work. Okay, This is very important. Now, I benefited from this family's uh, hard-working nature. In fact, I myself am a very, very hard-working person. That Protestant work ethic got uh, handed down to me in spades. And anybody who has either worked for me or with me will tell you about, about that quality. Now, I started working when I was 12 years old. 
My older brother had a paper route, and I saw the papers going out and the money coming in, and I kind of wanted a piece of it. I thought, well, that looks like a pretty good activity. So I twisted his arm, and I made him let me in on a piece of his paper route. With a few short months, I was outperforming him, I was out collecting him, and I was, I was out throwing him with these papers, okay? And I thought this seemed like a really great deal. After that, I uh, did every kind of odd job you could possibly imagine. I mowed lawns, I did gardening, I made sandwiches, I cleaned houses, I washed windows. I did anything it took to make a buck. In fact, my first professional job was actually selling cosmetics for Estee Lauder Corporation, a job I was very, very proud of at the time. Now you would ask yourself, why would Elizabeth throw herself into work at the age of 12? Okay? I have literally worked continuously since that time. And this is the reason. I have an off, awesome mom, an awesome feminist mother, and she taught me something very important, especially as a woman. She said, if you control your money, you will control the quality of your life. And I took this lesson that she taught me to heart. And so I have always wanted to control my own money. Now, uh, I also went to college, and I was one of the first people in my family to go to college. And I benefited, really, from almost free college education. In fact, my mother and I were students at the same university at the same time, okay? And she was slightly ahead of me, and she essentially helped me go through college through her own experience. I studied sociology in college, and as you know, sociologists study uh, social structures and institutions of all kind for information about what they say about us, both as individuals and as a society. And I loved my major, and I took it to heart. And one of the things that sociologists study is they study work. Okay? And work arrangements. And I took an academic interest in this field. Uh, also, lo and behold, it is actually my professional job to develop other people. As a learning professional, it is my job to help you do and be your best at work. Okay, that's what I do for a living, and I'm strongly, strongly invested in helping you perform at your best. Uh, more than a year ago, in fact, about two years ago, I started writing a column for our social learning platform, which is the Wisdom Cafe. And this project was called Take Five. And it was essentially a Learn Anywhere program. And basically what I did for a year was I wrote 52 short columns with five takeaway lessons that were career enhancing or skill building. There was a little teeny tiny part of this project called the future of work. And I added this part to the project because I wanted to attract millennials to the column. And I wanted to look way down into the future to see what might be happening for my millennial audience. It turned out that this part of the project was one of the most fascinating, gripping, super interesting parts of this year-long project. And I came to some grand realizations after a year of thinking about the future of work. And here is the big grand realization that I came to. And that is work is against you, okay? And it was kind of a watershed moment. And that's why I'm here standing before you today. Because because it is against you, I want to help you learn how to get ready for it. There are some seismic shifts taking place in the world of work that uh, are working against you. They're the very things that helped my family be upwardly mobile, and those things are changing and being eroded, and I want to talk to you about that today. Uh, I also want to mention that this session is to get you actionable. While I was working on this, I terrified myself, okay? Nobody likes being terrified alone, so I want to take you with me, <laughs> all right? I've never had this as a learning outcome from any session I've ever run in my life, that I intend to terrify my audience, but that's what I hope I do today. And the reason why is because when you step out of this room, I want you to do something different. I want you to make a change somewhere in your your working life that will help you get ready for this future. Now, the other thing I want to do is I want to make a little bit of a disclaimer here. I am not talking about work at UC Berkeley. I am talking about big national and even global trends in work that are meaningful. We see glimmers of them in our own working environment, but they are big global trends. Okay? Now, uh, I want to take you on a little tiny tour of my working life over the last three years before I get started, because the first lesson is embedded in this small tour. 
Now, this is just the last three years in my working life. I have reported through three senior executives. I reported through Kathy Koshlin and then uh, Janine uh, Raymond, and now I report through Joe Magnus. I have had four managers during this time. I reported through Cynthia Schrager and then Richard Freistadt uh, and then Jennifer Chiswick, and now uh, I report through Angela Stopper. My, I've changed my desk and cubicle three times during that time. 12 people have left my working group. Uh, sometimes their contracts were ended, a few people were laid off, uh, and seven people have joined the group. You can see slight downsizing there. In fact, there's been such a large change in the composition of my office that I'm not actually sure of these numbers anymore. It's, there's been that much change. I also went from a career position to a contract position back to a career position. I applied for another job, and I got the job, but I turned it down because it was a lateral move, and I didn't think it was the right career choice for me. I applied for another job, but I withdrew from the search because, again, it was a lateral move, and I didn't think it was the right thing. I applied for a promotion, which I did not get, which was a little disappointing, but lesson learned. Hopefully, a new opportunity will come along. Now, here's a big, epic seismic shift that happened in the last three years, which was the project I was hired to do has now ended, and I'm on a completely new project that I never saw coming, okay? And this is just in the last three years. Look familiar? How many of you have had a very changing workplace, okay? Now, this is what this looks like over the course of my entire UC Berkeley career. In fact, it couldn't fit on one slide because it was too big, okay? Now, this is one of the first things I want to share with you about the future of work, and that is the accelerated nature of change in the workplace, okay? Work is changing very, very rapidly, okay? Uh, now, I started working at UC Berkeley in 1987, okay? Uh, I had not yet graduated from college, but I was already working full time. Uh, I sat down to what looked almost exactly like this, okay? I sat down to an IBM Selectric typewriter. And to those of you who are not familiar, uh, the typewriter I used in college had its characters on little arms, and each character had a separate arm. In an IBM Selectric typewriter, the characters are on a little ball, and the ball whizzes up and down the piece of paper, and it makes a beautiful sound. And when you're working in an office where a lot of IBM Selectric typewriters at work, you just sound like the most badass working group ever in the history of the world. You sound like the most productive people. So I thought, wow, look at me. I've got, and that is my ideal version of myself when I was 23, <laughs> actually. Okay, so now here's the thing. I thought I had it made, right? I was only 23 years old. I had a stable, steady, full-time job at UC Berkeley, nonetheless. I had this incredibly cool equipment. I had a pension if I stayed long enough, and I was protected by a whole bunch of really awesome employment laws. And I thought, wow, this is great. Now, here's a few things that my 23-year-old immature brain did not anticipate, okay? The first was the incredible technological revolution that was about to happen. In fact, I had already worked at UC Berkeley for 10 years before a little memo crossed my desk, and it said, we're going to something called email. And what email is, is a little message is going to pop up on your computer screen, and you're going to be able to send little messages to other people's computer screen. And I looked at the memo, and I thought, this is the stupidest thing ever. I mean, <laughs> we have telephones, right? That's how we communicate, right? This is something that was completely lost on me. It was not one of my better forward-looking moments. I had a similar reaction to texting when I first found out what it was. I was like, there's no way that I could ever send a word-limited message. That's ridiculous, OK? Here's the other thing I did not anticipate. I did not anticipate the incredible cost of living increase in the cost of living in the Bay Area. I never in my wildest dreams thought it would cost me almost $5 for a cup of coffee on my way to work in the morning. The other thing I did not anticipate was I never thought my bachelor's degree would not be enough because my bachelor's degree was very hard won. I thought that I had actually checked the box on educational requirements. The other thing I did not anticipate was I did not think that the projects would become so much more complex and professionally motivated. When I started at UC Berkeley, it had a massive clerical and administrative staff structure. 
That is no longer true of our working environment. We have a massive professional staff structure now, and I did not see that coming. And the last thing I did not anticipate was the incredible cost of public higher education. When I first started working at Berkeley and advising students, the Berkeley education was incredibly affordable. Okay, This is really dramatically changed. And here's the big thing that I did not anticipate. I did not anticipate, as most people did not, the huge recession of 2008. Okay? Now, I was very lucky when the recession happened. I did not lose my job. I was not laid off, and I'm very, very grateful for that. But what did happen to me was I got stuck in a single job for almost a decade because of hiring freezes and other downsizing. And what that did was it stalled my pay, it stalled my title, and it stalled my ability to make network and other correct, uh, connections uh, with a broader community. And this was uh, kind of a hole that I'm still actually trying to dig out of. Okay? Now, because I made these mistakes in planning, I'm here to help you not make these same mistakes. Okay? So these are my 10 big, huge observations about the future of work and what you need to be prepared for and get ready for in the future. Now, you don't need to write this down because it's on your handout. Okay? Now, before I get going, and we are going to get a little terrified here, but I promise it's going to be worth it. Okay? <laughs> So the first thing I want to talk about before I get going on this, because these things have been very active in my mind as I was planning. The first is a very, very famous sociological study. Uh, it's a, it, it came in the form of a book called Working. And it was made by a very famous sociologist named Studs Terkel. And Studs Terkel was a great interviewer of people. And he was able to create wonderful rapport with a wide range of people. And what he did was he went out and he interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people about their jobs. Okay? He interviewed bus drivers and car uh, salesmen and uh, people who were switchboard operators. And he uh, even interviewed people who dug graves. He even interviewed prostitutes to ask them how they felt about their work. He interviewed executives. He basically covered every type of blue and white collar job there is out there. Now, there are a couple of grand overarching uh, realizations from this study that I want to share with you. One is that uh, the jobs that people had were in some ways too small for their spirit. Okay? And what that impact had was it had a huge impact on identity and quality of life. There is a very strong association between what you do for a living, your quality of life, and how you think and feel about yourself. The other realization, and this is really amazing, this book was assigned to me when I was in college. Many of these jobs no longer exist. Okay? There is no such thing as a switchboard operator who takes a cable and, and uh, puts it in a switchboard anymore. That is rapid and accelerated change in jobs as we know it. Now, here's the other study that has been working very profoundly on my mind. It appeared in The Atlantic, I think, last year. Some of you might have seen this article. It kind of went viral. Uh, and it's about what is called, essentially, the new American aristocracy. We tend to think of wealth in the United States as concentrated in this 1%, right? We've heard about this 1% that controls all the wealth in the U.S. Actually, it turns out that it's a little more than 1%. It turns out it's about 9.9% of people, Americans, actually hold wealth. Okay? And this new wealth class is doing something that most wealth classes have not done in the past, and that is they are closing access. They are essentially doing what is now termed dream hoarding. Okay? And there is also a new form of capital wealth capital. And Matthew Stewart, who wrote this article, calls them the five Gs. Good family, good neighborhood, good education, good health, good job. That is now the recipe for upward mobility and becoming that part of that 9.9%. Okay? Now, this 9.9%, they're doing a number of things that close access. And one of the things they're doing, sociologists call assortive mating. And I'm going to give you a crude description of what a sort of mating is. Uh, most of you are familiar with the television series Mad Men, right? Don Draper is a Madison Ag Avenue executive, and Don Draper, during this series, marries his secretary. Okay? That's a, a, a one of the ways that we've had an upwardly mobile class structure. Uh, we do it sometimes through marriage. In the new assortive mating model, 
Madison Avenue executives no longer marry their secretary. They marry other Madison Avenue executives. Doctors marry other doctors. Lawyers marry other lawyers. Uh, executives of all kind marry other executives. That's what a sort of mating is. And that's part of this new closed system. Okay? The other thing Matthew Stewart talks about in this article is something called intergenerational income elasticity. And this is the way that he describes it in the article. When you're born, you're born into your parents' social class, and you have to think about it as a ladder. You're somewhere on this social class ladder. You born, you're born into a high social class, middle class, social class, or a low social class. And you have a kind of rubber band around your ankle. And what this uh, measure, it measures how much you're able to stretch that rubber band from your parents' class to, go, to become upward mobile. Okay? Even though we think about America as being the land of opportunity, that rubber band is not stretching anymore. We have one of the most inelastic social class systems now of any developed country. Okay? That's news to a lot of people. You are very likely to stay in your parents' social class, and that is a new reality. Now, here's the other thing that has been working overtime on my brain. Okay? Since the recession, we have seen the development of a new underclass. Okay? And that new underclass is people who are chronically unemployed or underemployed. And that new underclass is primarily made up of older women. Okay? This is also a new reality. When the recession hit, a lot of people who had good jobs uh, no longer had those good jobs, and they slid into poverty, into illness, into mental illness, and they have lower life expectancy. This is a very, very strong thing at work in our class structure now, this new underclass. Okay? Now, I want to get to this top 10 countdown, because this is the backdrop to understanding these seismic shifts that are happening in the workplace. The first one is called employment insecurity. Okay? And what it is being driven by is economic and geopolitical uncertainty, and what is essentially our new gig economy, and a reliance on what's called just-in-time workers, and the erosion of what we know as standard work. So let me explain what standard work is. When I came to UC Berkeley and I sat down at my IBM Selectric typewriter, I had a standard job. I had a full-time job with benefits and a pension, okay? And it was stable, and I worked on the same thing continuously, okay? That standard job is kind of a thing of the past. Because of the gig economy, uh, we are actually, companies, what they need to do now is they need to be a little more nimble. So what they do is they assemble workers and they shed those workers. They don't keep people in standard jobs anymore. There's been a number of research studies that show that even public sector work is being affected by the erosion of the standard job. When I came to UC Berkeley, there was a little bit of an exchange. I exchanged sometimes higher pay for work security. I mean, uh, right. I, I, I took a somewhat lower sa salary because I had a very secure job. This is now seismically shifting. In Australia, fewer than 50% of workers now work in standard jobs. That is a seismic shift. The other thing that we're seeing is a rise in new workplace arrangements. And these workers are not called standard workers. They're called gig workers. And the new gig arrangements are, one is called boundless work, and that means you don't work for a single employer continuously. I'm very highly unusual that I have worked for a single employer over 30 years. This is a thing of the past. I'm somewhat of a rare artifact of the past now. The other thing is we're changing to what is called portfolio work, where you have multiple employers at the same time, okay? And the other is something called shape-shifting, where you have lots of different skills and you apply them to different projects. You don't do the same work, right? So I'm an instructional designer, I'm a consultant, I'm a, an analyst, and I do all of that simultaneously. These are the new workplace arrangements. 
Now here's the other one, project-based work. And these are very deeply intertwined. And this has to do essentially with the rise in artificial intelligence. Work will come and it will go because it is based on a project that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And there is actually a very good example at UC Berkeley that I'm going to uh, talk about in just a minute of this project-based work. Now the thing about project-based work is if artificial intelligence, if a robot is doing a lot of what we consider our uh, you know, routine tasks, uh, what it does is it means human capital, your brain has to be put on something much more complicated. And that is a project, uh, usually a complicated project, that has a lot of specialized workers working on it. Now here's the UC Berkeley example. How many of you are familiar with the assembling and disbanding of the student information systems project? Or you may even have worked on that project. Okay, that was a form of new, a new form of work. We had a lot of standard workers, so people who were uh, career employees who went to SIS, but they retained their career status. We had a lot of people who went from career status to contract status, and the contract had a beginning and an end, and they gave up their secure employment. And we had a mix of remote workers. Some of them worked off-site, some of them worked for PeopleSoft, and this project assembled all of these workers to work on this complex problem. Now, some people made out brilliantly in this new work arrangement. They got higher pay, they got a better title, and they cleaned up pretty well. But some people didn't. When this project disbanded, they had to really scramble to find other work. And this is a new work reality that you need to be ready for. Now here's the other one, temporary work and contracting. This is short-term contract work. Sometimes we talk about this as a side hustle. Okay, does anybody in this room have a job that you work at UC Berkeley, plus you work for Lyft or Uber, or you drive, or someone in your family does? They have a side hustle job. Anyone here? A few people, okay? Uh, right now, uh, over 40 million Americans now have this side hustle or this uh, casual or temporary work. This is an enormous increase. This is a huge shift in work arrangement. Okay, uh, it's so prevalent in metropolitan areas that it is actually called Uber cities now. Uber cities are places where people essentially survive based on this casual, temporary, uncontract work. Now, there was another fascinating article that just appeared in The Atlantic just a couple of weeks ago called, I Delivered Packages for Amazon and It Was a Nightmare. And what this article talked about was that this person got a side hustle job. They thought, oh, driving for Amazon to deliver packages, which are not done exclusively by uh, UPS anymore, they use independent drivers now, uh, I can make up to $25 an hour to deliver packages out of my car for Amazon. That's the work arrangement. Okay, it sounds sweet, right? You can make up to $500 extra just a week uh, delivering packages. Well, here's the thing that this side hustle does not really tell you. If you get a parking ticket while you drive, you pay for it. If there is no work, you do not work at all. You pay for your own vehicle maintenance, and this person went from 40,000 miles on their car to 140,000 miles on their car in seven months. If you, you pay for tolls, you get no overtime if you do not de deliver your packages in the allotted time. If you're injured, you are injured or you injure someone else, that's your problem. You get no benefits, there are no employment protections, but hey, guess what? If you violate a work rule, you can be terminated. So what this does to the work arrangement that is 18 to $25 an hour is it takes it to below minimum wage when you add in all of those assumed costs, okay? Now, here's another one. It's called bad work, okay? Now, bad work is characterized by a complete lack of control over the work environment or working conditions. It is usually happening in low-wage jobs, and it is increasing our uh, 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 separation of class, okay? It is hitting retail extremely hard. Anybody in here know someone who works in retail or has worked in retail recently? Okay, yes, I have a friend who actually had this working life, and it was pretty miserable. Uh, in retail, it's also hitting trucking, by the way, uh, and there's a lot of complicated issues there. Uh, basically what's happening is that retail is operating on smart systems now, smart scheduling systems. So if the store you're working for is not busy, you get sent home, okay? You don't work your full shift. If it is busy, you have to drop everything and go into work. 
Okay? The other thing that it creates is something called clopening. How, how many are familiar with the term clopening? That means that you close the store, sometimes as late as midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., but you have to open it the next morning when it opens at 6 a.m. So essentially you have shorter than a six hour rest period between shifts. This creates absolute chaos on families. It creates chaos with child rearing uh, and planning of all kind. Now, some of you have, may have heard, and this is very good economic news, that we have really returned to full employment. Our unemployed numbers have gone way, way down. Okay, this is good news. In some cities, there are more jobs than there are workers. This is great, right? Now, you would wonder to yourself, why are there more jobs than workers? Well, there's two very important things here at work. One is that some of these are highly technical jobs where there are, uh, we don't have an adequately skilled workforce to actually pick up that work. And the other is that a lot of this work would be in the bucket of bad work. And that is because wages have not kept up with corporate profits. Even though corporations have recovered, they have not shared their increasing wealth. Now, here's the other one. It's called hyper-professionalization. And that is the need for additional professional certification, credentialing, advanced degrees. This is the big mistake I made. I never thought my bachelor's degree would not be enough. And now I am scrambling and working very, very hard to make up for what ended up being a seismic liability, and that is an educational gap, OK? Uh, just in the last five years, 38% of employers have raised the standard educational requirement for their jobs. That means a job you used to have a high school diploma for requires a bachelor's degree now. A job you needed a bachelor's degree for needs a master's degree. And a master's degree job usually needs an EDD or a PhD now. Okay, You're all aware of this, right? Also, our jobs, because they're project-based, requ require increasing specialization. Now, this is uh, going back to the five Gs. This is a way that wealth and systems get closed. If you can afford that $100,000 undergraduate degree, you're good to go. If you can tack on the 30 to 40 or even $50,000 of that master's or PhD, you're good to go. But if you can't, oops, kind of bad news for you. OK, now here's another thing that's happening. And this is core skill changes. Okay? What we used to think about as our basic workplace changes are massively changing. Uh, and they are changing, and they're looking more like this. Data and new media literacy. Computational thinking. These are workplace skills of the future. Cross-cultural competency. These are the skills that are needed for workers right now. And there's a lot of drivers here. One of them is our smart machines and technology and increasing artificial intelligence. One of them is a rise in computational work. How many of you know what computational work is? Or you could describe it. Or you're drawing a blank. You're drawing a blank a little bit. OK. This is really, we have large, large, large amounts of data right, and information. These people sort through and now to know how to handle that data and information. In fact, there's a new undergraduate major on the Berkeley campus called data science. And that data science major is to get people ready to do that kind of work. Also, we have an increasingly interconnected global environment. And people are now on virtual teams. They work uh, literally virtually. Now, uh, the Institute for the Future, uh, there's a report and there's a link on your handout to get to this report about what these future workplace skills look like, what the drivers are like, and how you get ready for this. If there's one thing that you do today, I want you to go out and read this report because it's remarkable. If your resume does not currently list future workplace skills, I would really seriously ask you to go out and think about how you can begin to identify and develop what skills are going to be important for you in the future. OK, here's another one, extreme commute. The extreme commute is a commute of two hours or more. Anybody in this uh, room commute two hours or more? OK, a few people. There are a few people in my immediate working group who also commute more than two hours uh, in order to get to work uh, every day. Now, this is a map of the Bay Area. And what it shows, it, it has two data points that are overlaid, overlaid here. One of the data points is the cost of housing, OK? Uh, and as you see, the cost of housing gets more affordable as you fan out from the major metropolitan age, uh, areas. And you even have to go sub, uh, um, 
sub-suburban to get affordable housing now. And what it does, it overlays the commute time for these affordable living areas. And these commute times are now more than two hours in each direction. They include two train rides and a bus ride, okay? That is an increasing reality for many, many people. And this is not just in the Bay Area. This is in every major metropolitan area in the United States. Now, here's another thing. Now, in order to avoid that commute, you might want to work anywhere, OK? And a lot of work arrangements are becoming work anywhere jobs. In fact, the last time I did a job search for a job that I might want to take, uh, at least a third of the jobs were remote. They were work anywhere jobs, which was really surprising to me. But partly it's because I'm a consultant, and consultants can do work anywhere, but this is a really new reality, OK? Now, I love my work anywhere job, and I do have a work anywhere job, OK? I uh, think it's the most fantastic thing in the world because it gives me a lot of flexibility. Not everyone feels that way about work anywhere work. And the reason why is because there becomes a very blurred line between your work life and your personal life, okay? Now, as the hard worker I am, I work on the weekends, I work at night, I work on vacation, I work uh, when I'm sick, I work on airplanes, I work anywhere and everywhere. And in a lot of ways, I actually work more than if I reported to a standard eight to five job. So the combination of my Calvinist upbringing and my work anywhere job is that I work all the time, okay? Now, uh, some people see this as a dream come true. And if you are a very disciplined person and you're in the right line of work and you see people when you walk through cafes, they're at work. They're sitting in the Blue Bottle restaurant and they are working. And in fact, many restaurants are actually uh, uh, carving out sections for workers to actually work remotely, okay? Now, again, it remains to be seen whether these work anywhere arrangements will give you more or less freedom. And it's gonna depend on the individual. Now here's another one, reduced or no benefits, okay? Now, I am the grateful recipient of a pension plan, which I have worked very hard, uh, but there is a big difference between a defined benefit, that's a pension, and a defined contribution plan. Defined contribution plan is a 401k plan, okay, or similar uh, 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 fund that you contribute to, okay? Now, the big difference here is that if I live to be 110, I will still get my pension because my pension will last for my entire lifetime. When I save for a 401k plan, I have to figure out when I'm going to die. I have to guess how long I'll live. And if I guess wrong, oh, I'm going to run out of money. That is a big difference, OK? And because people are living longer and needing more care at the end of life, that is a big change in our reality. Now, uh, actually, this is now this came about as an unfortunate consequence of the 80s and 90s. In the 80s and 90s, pension uh, promises were in some ways overly generous. They were very enthusiastic, okay? Uh, they were very, very generous. And some of the pension funds were actually mismanaged. So what that has created across the United States is essentially a looming crisis of underfunded <coughs> pensions. Right now, 16 states have under seriously, woefully underfunded pensions. And what this does is it takes away from a lot of other things that's, that uh, uh, communities need, okay? Uh, if you throw in, endangered uh, entitlement programs, uh, threats to Medicare, to Social Security, you really have a looming crisis that you need to get ready for. Okay, now here's another one, working longer, okay? We always thought the retirement age was 60 to 65. In fact, for the generation before me, Social Security actually started at 62. It doesn't start until 67 now for people my age, okay? This is a big, big difference. Right now, 32% of Americans are working to 65 years or older. That's a third of all Americans. Now, some of them are doing this by choice because a lot of people realize that retirement was sort of obsolescence, right? I felt useless in my retirement. I was bored. I went back to work because I want to work. Because again, that tie between work and identity is so incredibly strong. Okay? But some people, and a lot of people, especially uh, really middle to low income people, are working longer because of necessity. Okay? This is the US right now. Again, about a third of our total workforce planning to work to 70. 
And the pink bar is the number of people, growing number of people, higher than any other developed country who expect to never stop working. They plan to work until they die. That is a new reality. OK. Now, here is the big clincher of all of this. And that is something called systemic inequality. And these are active biases at work that are gender, race, culture, ability, class, and educational biases. And every single one of us is subject to these biases. Okay? Now, we've heard a lot about this recently. For every dollar a man makes, a woman makes 79 cents. There is a very significant gender pay gap. And this is what it looks like if you are a person of color. It goes even down. Now, if you're a woman, you make less than a dollar. But if you are an African-American woman, it's even less than that. And if you are of Hispanic origin, a Hispanic female, it's 56 cents. This is a really harsh reality. Okay? Now, uh, this article just appeared in the New York Times. Okay? Pregnancy dis ram uh, discrimination rampant in biggest companies. There's a massive class action suit right now from women who found their careers completely stalled and in some ways actually very marginalized because of pregnancy and child rearing arrangements. Now, this is an active, active bias at work. And you look at this and you think, wow, aren't we past this yet? Haven't we you know, gotten past this? Don't our employment laws uh, protect us against this? This article appeared on June 15th, 2018. That's the current status of active bias, OK? Now, here's another one. You might have seen this big class action suit against Harvard University brought by Asian Americans. Harvard University has an admission interview as part of its selection process. And lo and behold, Asian Americans, all of them, rated lower on personality qualities than any other race that applied to Harvard, OK? Wow. Sounds a lot like could be active bias at their uh, work there, right? This also appeared on June 15th, 2018. Okay? I am very, very aware of this bias as a middle-aged woman. In fact, there was actually a study done where they sent out resumes and female for women, uh, all different kinds of jobs. And the only difference between the resumes was they changed dates to uh, indicate who was an older or younger worker. And the older women, uh, middle-aged women and beyond, uh, had the worst possible outcomes from this exercise. They had the most gender bias of any of these applicants. When people see that date of college degree, they see that date of first employment, they make assumptions about you. Okay. Now, this is the part where we get actionable. I just terrified you. <laughs> You're very upset. I gave you a lot of bad news. You're worried, OK? Now, this is the part where I want to help you, OK? Because this is a little terrifying. This is a big, big change. The big handout that you have in front of you that folds over that looks like a piece of, uh, looks a little bit like a placemat or a little book insert, it has to do items in it, OK? It has all the links. It gives you actionable questions. And it's going to basically give you a roadmap to getting yourself ready for this future of work. And I want you. Before you uh, leave this conference at some point today, to circle at least three things on that to-do list that you are going to do immediately to get ready for work. In fact, the only indicator of whether this session was a success or not is how actionable you become. When I realized this and I made my big grand epiphany, I flung into action, OK? Now, the only other thing I want to uh, mention to you, and this is not on the list, but it is a new reality called uh, a professional portfolio, OK? It's not just a resume anymore. You have to show work samples. And the other prediction I have is that work portfolio is going to become incredibly important to your future employment, because that is project-based work. And I, right now, am completing a professional portfolio that essentially shows the work I've done to any future employer so they can see the quality, not just what I listed on a resume, but the quality of the projects. Now, I want to go back to your predictions for just a second, that those predictions you made. OK? Uh, anybody, uh, did you write the thing that was potentially negative or fearful, one of these things that appeared on this list? Uh, who wants to share? Yes. Um, the negative thing I put was less human rights, lower quality of life. 
Okay, less human rights, lower quality of life. Okay, that's a fear, okay? In some ways, I've touched on that, right? We see increasing social stratification, increasing polarization, increasing uh, uh, polarization in access to opportunity. That's very significant, okay? Uh, yes, Janine. And, and negatives were in, uh, increasing continued salary stagnation? Oh, uh, sal salary stagnation. Okay, salary stagnation, yes. That's a very important one. Anybody else? <coughs> Yes, humans being replaced by machines. If you think that your job is not replaceable by a machine, you might want to think again about that. I never thought a car could drive itself, but I think we're on the verge of that as well, all right? I never thought my IBM Selectric typewriter wasn't going to be enough, right? These are the mistakes we make, OK? Now, I can't leave you. Did anybody have something that I didn't touch on? Anybody have something that uh, was kind of outside the box here? Yes? How much more value there seems to be nowadays in networking and who you know, even sometimes that can trump education. Okay, that's wonderful. That's phenomenal. Did you hear what she said? She said the value of networking and whether the value of networking can trump other things. That goes back to the five G's. That good family and good neighborhood, those are two of the five G's. Those create connections. That is essentially the gated community, if you will, of connectedness, OK? If you live in a good neighborhood that's full of doctors and lawyers, it's very likely that you're going to be very well connected, OK? That is, yes, those are very important. And those workplace connections. Now, let me just tell you uh, briefly, the way I grew my career without this advanced degree was to basically take on new projects and show that I could do it, was just to demonstrate that I could do it. That is not the way you get work now. And I have seen my career almost com come to a complete stall because that is not the way jobs uh, uh, are acquired these days. That's not how you get promotions. That's not how you advance. It's through connectedness and networking, OK? Very important. Now, I can't leave you on a terrible note. I can't you feeling, feeling awful, OK? I just can't. I like you too much, OK? So here's some cool, fun things about the future of work, OK? And I want to hear what maybe what one of your positive predictions was. What was the pro positive prediction? Nothing. It all seemed doom and gloom. <laughs> I think the influence of women in the workforce is going to be incredibly powerful. Great. Break down some awesome. Dynamics. Yes. Influence of women in the workplace, a positive. Thank you so much. Yes. OK. Now, this is your future desk. <laughs> or it could be your future desk. OK? Cool, right? Now, you don't, you're not sitting and typing anymore. Your eyes are visually tracking. And that's how you're doing work on multiple screens. OK? I sensitivity and recognition in a much more comfortable chair than I have currently, OK? That could be a good thing. We're not sure. But these are some of the phantasmagorical things that people are thinking up. Now, here's the office building of the future, OK? Cool. The outdoors comes indoors, and it's available to everyone, OK? How many of you lack a window in your office currently? You have no access to outside space, OK? Yeah, it's pretty miserable, right? You don't know whether it's raining. You don't know whether there's clouds. You don't know whether it's sunny. It's not hot or cold. Right. This is potentially changing because this is a much more enjoyable and humane workplace uh, visioning for the future. Now, here's the other one. And this is the inside of an office in the future. There's a place to rest, possibly to sleep. There's places to play. And one would ask himself, why does this future office space look like a, a, a playground? OK? It's because project-based work requires novel and adaptive thinking. It has to be like a learning space because you're working on projects that you no know, one knows the answer to, right? So more and more, it's possible we would see these workplace spaces look like schools or playgrounds or places where you play, because that's where the leaps in creativity and ingenuity happen. OK? I, I really personally like this one a lot. Um, I actually took a tour of the LinkedIn uh, facility corporate headquarters in San Francisco, and it looked exactly like this. There were places to rest, places to exercise, places to huddle, uh, places to dream. There were visioning uh, spaces, because that is the type of work that is being done there. OK? Now, I want to go back to my wonderful feminist mother here. 
okay? I grew up on Mary Tyler Moore, and Mary Tyler Moore was my heroine, okay? I wanted to be just like her. I wanted to have her apartment. I wanted to have her friends. I wanted to have her job. I wanted Mr. Grant to be my boss. And she was the ultimate career woman to me, okay? And she sends really a positive, a positive message, which is that you're going to make it after all, okay? And I want to leave you with that thought. Because of the mistakes I made, and I do feel very personal about this, uh, I made big seismic uh, errors in my guessing, and I want to help prevent you from doing that. So while work is against you, I hope you're ready now. Thank you all very, very much.